Hello, everyone, and welcome to um, the second in a series of UN75 Dialogues hosted by um, the SDG Action uh, Campaign. And uh, this week, uh, the dialogue is going to focus on um, healthy lives, healthy societies, and a uh, healthy planet. Um, let me use this opportunity to thank all of you for taking time to join us um, on this. Um, for those of you that um, did register and, here, and are here, as well as those of you that are going to be following us um, on the YouTube channel, since we're also live um, on YouTube. Um, with, uh, at the beginning of this, whilst you were signing in, we had this very interesting poll that was going on. Um, so far, uh, for the people who took the polls, we have about 20% of you coming from Africa, 25% from the Americas, 32% from Asia, 18% from Europe, 5% from the Middle East, and two from Oceania. Um, our gender balance here, we have uh, um, well, 45% female, 55% uh, male, um, so far, and 2% prefer not to share. Within the age group, we have um, between the ages of 17 to 25, 25% 20, of our participants. Uh, those who are 25 to 34, 30%, and 35 to 50, 30%, and above uh, 51, 16%. Um, we also have one question, has COVID redirected your personal focus on climate action in recent months. And most of you said very much. Um, what is, uh, that's 38% of you said very much. 43% said somewhat, um, whilst 14% said not at all. And 7% uh, um, not at all and focused the same amount on climate action. So, we wanted to use this service to know who our audience is, to know where you're coming from, and to know where you are. And that that will uh, that gives us an idea of what you are thinking. That the majority of people um, either think that COVID has affected the way they perceive climate action, or somewhat affected the way that they perceive climate action, which explains the necessity for having such a conversation because the world ahead of us is going to be slightly different from the world we had pre-COVID. The pools, you have already tested it for those of you that took the pools. Uh, we are going to be running about three of them during this is our way of engaging with you, the audience, making sure that you're part of this conversation. We also have, um, uh, we will also be doing a question and answer session towards the end of this, uh, but I would say, put your questions not in the chat box, but in the question and answer section. So when it's Q and A at the bottom of your screen, that's where you should uh, drop your questions. We, I cannot guarantee that we will take all the questions because time is a factor, but we will try to also pick up some of those questions and use them in the course of uh, the, the dialogue. Also, all participants are going to be muted. Um, uh, or conversations can take place in the chat box or by way of the, the Q&A section. So do not panic if you cannot hear yourself when you try to speak. It is by design. Uh, we also uh, are testing um, the uh, subtitles that you see at the bottom of your screen um, so that those who are impaired can also be part of this conversation um, it may not be 100% accurate, but we're moving in that direction. Um, with that said, I once more want to welcome you uh, to this session. I'm going to quickly um, introduce, um, uh, before I go on to introduce, uh, quickly introduce our panelists, we will run a poll and then we will begin with our, our first guest speaker. Uh, my name is Are Obenson. I'm CEO of, uh, of a company called Transcommunity. Uh, we are lucky to have here with us today um, two guest speakers, um, the, 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 the host of this uh, dialogue, uh, who is none other than the director 
of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Action Campaign, Marina Ponti, who will be um, having our closing remarks here today. Um, for our opening, the guest speaker is going to be um, Natalie Samara Singye, who is the Chief of Strategy um, at the um, UN75 Office for the commemoration of this anniversary. Um, we have uh, four great uh, panelists who are joining us from different parts of the world, uh, from the United States uh, with tremendous experience um, from uh, an organization called Global Citizen. Um, Aaron Holtz is the policy director for gender equality and inclusion. Aaron brings a lot of experience to this conversation and I'm looking forward to hearing from him. We also have um, Merrily Vares. Merrily Vares is the executive director and member of the management board of the Let's Do It Foundation. Uh, the Let's Do It Foundation uh, is the organization that started the global cleanup campaign, World Cleanup Day. Uh, so Merrily will be bringing that perspective to this conversation. And somebody that I've got, just gotten to know, Ricky Ketch. Uh, Ricky is um, it's a Grammy Award winner, a U US Billboard number one artist. He is a UNESCO Global Ambassador for Kindness and UNICEF uh, Celebrity Supporter. And I can go on and on and on talking about Ricky's uh, achievements, but um, Ricky uh, will be bringing um, that global perspective of um, uh, and talent to this uh, conversation. And finally, we have uh, Vanessa Nakate. Vanessa Nakate is, um, is a climate activist from Uganda and she was the first uh, Fridays for Future Climate Activists in, in Uganda and founder of the Rise Up Climate Movement, which has uh, created opportunity for African youth to join this conversation about climate action. She's also um, been talking a, a lot about saving the forest in, in the Congo Basin. So um, Vanessa brings also that youthful activist perspective to the conversation. So these are our, our panelists that are going to be talking uh, to us today. Now, before I go on to introduce why we are doing this conversation, I want to uh, start by asking whether you all have taken the, the UN75 survey, and I'm wishing that we get 100% out of this conversation, but uh, we want to know whether you have taken the survey, um, and we have a poll that's going on. Uh, please take a moment to tell us whether you have taken that survey or not. So I'm waiting to, to make sure that most of you get the chance to take the, the poll. Um, yeah, so about 55%, this is better than the last time when we did this, about 55% of you have, have taken the survey, another 45% haven't taken the survey. So, I encourage you, and we're going to be trying to make sure that you, we, we remind you throughout this session uh, to, to take the, the survey. Um, with that said, uh, we are doing this uh, dialogue, this series of dialogue hosted by the uh, UN SDG Action Campaign, uh, because um, 2020 marks the 75th anniversary of the uh, United uh, Nations. And the Secretary General of the United Nations, instead of throwing a big party, wanted to have this global conversation with people around the world. And it couldn't have come at an opportune time, especially after everything that we're seeing happening with, with COVID. And I can say even more for those of us who are in the United States, this seems to be the opportune time to have these conversations with the world about where we are going. 
So at this time, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. Um, she is the Chief of Strategy at the UN Office for the Commemoration of this 75th anniversary. And she is better placed to tell us why we're having this conversation with you. Natalie. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, a warm uh, good afternoon or good morning, evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm really grateful to Transform Unity and our, our wonderful colleagues in the SDG Action Campaign for convening this, this discussion and this um, fantastic panel. It really does feel so, so timely, the conversation that we will have today. Um, when we started planning, you know, what the 75th anniversary should look like, and this was last year, the Secretary General was very clear that we, you know, we should not treat 2020 as a, as a big birthday celebration. And, you know, as Ari has said, you know, in a way, thank goodness for that, given, given where we are today. Um, COVID-19, you know, continues to, to upend the lives of billions of people. And we do not yet know how to, how to beat this virus. And we don't know when we will know. But the one thing we do know is that this is much more than a health crisis. It really has exposed the uh, fragility uh, of our societies and economies. Oh, sorry, something's gone wrong with my video. Um, it really has exposed the fragility of our societies and economies. It has exposed the, the, the deep inequalities and violence that is you know, really built into so many of our systems and our structures. It has also underscored how deeply interconnected we are and that we cannot look at health challenges in isolation from environmental, economic, political, and social issues. And it has also highlighted just how badly we need to rebuild trust between people and institutions. This was actually something that the Secretary General identified as one of the, the main challenges facing the world. If you think of you know, geopolitics, the climate crisis, new technologies, all these big picture issues, pandemics, he included a lack of trust and a disconnect that people feel with their leaders and institutions as, as big a challenge that we need to overcome. And that's why UN 75 was formed. We were formed in response to that, to listen to people's hopes and fears for the future and to gather ideas and solutions to the challenges we face. I think now in light of the pandemic, our initiative has actually taken on more significance because we are the bridge, I think, for the UN to reach out to people at this time and ensure that they have a say in how we manage this crisis. Decisions are being taken now, huge amounts of money, you know, have been spent, will be spent, that will have an impact for, for a long time to come. And we want to give through our surveys, through our dialogues, people the chance to say, this is how we need to take these decisions and spend this money in a way that puts us on, on the path to a safer, fairer, and more sustainable future. So this dialogue today is incredibly important. What, what you say will be captured, it will be, part of our reporting to world leaders uh, who are going to adopt a UN 75 declaration in September. That declaration is really intended to serve as a vision for the future. Um, so it's, it's very important that we have the ideas before that. And we're also doing this through our survey. I'm so happy that most, uh, you know, the majority of people on, on, on this, uh, listening to this event have taken it. I urge the 45% who haven't to please do so and share it with your networks. We also now have an app to help people collect responses from those who are not offline. And I just wanna share with you three very quick findings from our results to, to date. So these are results from about 150,000 people across 191 countries. And they have said that their top priority for recovering better from the pandemic, unsurprisingly, is access to healthcare. But strengthening global solidarity is number two, followed by rethinking the global economy. On priorities for the longer term, people want environmental protection, respect for human rights, and less conflict. Even though health has surged in the priorities list uh, over the last few weeks, those three uh, you know, top issues have remained pretty, pretty constant. And people want a meaningful say in global decision making. They want to be empowered through education, equal opportunities and access to justice. They want the barriers they face to be removed, discrimination, 
human rights abuses and corruption. I think this shows us two things. One, people are thinking big. Uh, and we have to respond in kind, and that will be you know, our, you know, the challenge for governments and for the UN. It won't be enough for us to create a big list of you know, broad priorities. We will need concrete and feasible proposals for change. And if there's one thing the past weeks and months have shown is that huge transformations are possible, things we could not have imagined were achieved in a short space of time, because political leadership was aligned with public support and because people understood the urgency. So as we look ahead to September when the UN 75 vision will be adopted, we hope that we can work together to, to really make this moment count so that we don't look back at 2020 as only the year of disaster and crisis, but the year when we changed course and finally got on the path to a more equal and sustainable world, a more open and inclusive UN, and where we moved, I think, from, from you know, the, the very valid principle of leaving no, no one behind to actually looking at how we can lift everyone up. I will stop my remarks there uh, and really look forward to the discussion today. Thank, thank you very much, uh, 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 Natalie. Um, you know, the things that I picked up is really how we look forward to a world that is different than, than the one that we're leaving behind us. And, and like you said, the, the, the crisis has, has really demonstrated that if, where there is the will, we always find a way in the things that we've been able to accomplish um, as a repost to the crisis. So um, thank you so much. That really sets the context of the, the conversation that we're having, um, which will dwell around the, the, the questions raised in the UN 75 uh, survey, uh, but will have a, a focus on, on these three questions. How do we um, lead, build a healthy planet? A healthy planet in which, uh, which will lead to um, healthy lifestyles, healthy uh, societies. Um, how do we emerge from this global uh, pandemic um, and unite the world towards building sustainable societies? How do we build resilience in communities around the world? Um, how do we ensure that institutions, governments, and policymakers make science-based decisions that would advance, move us towards that future that the world is yearning uh, for? And what role also do citizens have to play in ensuring that we move towards that healthy planet that we want? Uh, these conversations are the conversations we're going to be having uh, with our panelists. So I'm going to turn this over now to the panelists and and I'll go and I'll, we will begin the conversation with you all. So um, I'm going to uh, begin this conversation. I want to um, um, bring in Ricky. Um, and I want to just start with, um, based on what Natalie uh, said and the conversation that you've been having, um, what what should the international community prioritize uh, to recover better uh, from the, the pandemic? So thank you for, uh, for having me and, uh, and I'm in complete uh, alignment with uh, Natalie on her, uh, on, what, uh, on the remarks that she made, uh, absolutely well done. So the, uh, the, I think the international community needs to prioritize uh, you know, to tackle the uh, climate crisis with greater urgency, simply because, as Natalie said, you know that uh, uh, that you know when it came to the climate crisis, everybody said that you know people are not capable of behavioral change because behavioral change is what is needed. People are not going to change the way that they do things. But this pandemic has very clearly shown us that if people are faced with a clear and imminent danger to themselves and to their uh, uh, and to their loved ones, then they are very very capable of strong behavioral change in a very short time. And uh, next thing is that uh, achieving universal and affordable uh, access to digital technology. I think that's extremely important because now uh, the pandemic has pretty much shown us that, uh, you know, if you're not online, then you're pretty much invisible and entire communities are going invisible because of lack of digital access to digital technology. 
um, I as a musician, I am unable to perform live with musicians in on the other side of the world simply because the technology does not exist for musicians to perform together, you know, in different parts of the world uh, because of latency issues. And it's just frustrating sometimes to, uh, uh, to you know, perform. So that's just uh, my end of it. And uh, the third thing is, uh, of course, that increased support to communities who have been hit the hardest because as we know with pretty much every crisis, uh, you know, that we have ever faced, uh, that, uh, uh, that, you know, people who are hit the hardest are people who are at least at fault. So I think it's very important for us to increase support to communities who have been hit the hardest uh, by this uh, pandemic. Well, thank you very much, Ricky. And, and I, that's a very interesting perspective because I see that a lot of um, sessions have been organized for, for, for music online, but, but from your perspective as a musician, it, it's, it, we, I wouldn't have thought about it that way. Um, let me go on to um, Merrily. Uh, with your background in, um, um, in, in that work that you do at the Let's Do It Foundation, um, what do you think should be the priority of the international uh, community? Thanks, Harry. Hello from my side. Uh, greetings from Estonia. Um, I think um, it's, it's not a surprise that my first priority would be also tackling the climate crisis and, and, uh, and uh, doing it with greater urgency. Just before we started to, um, just before the Corona uh, crisis or the the lockdowns, uh, Europe, who has been the leading uh, role in uh, creating the uh, greener economies and green solutions and um, and launching the Green Deal, uh, which uh, which was a very uh, great success to to all to us all. Um, we we saw that, that there's a there was a high discussion or a, or a lot of um, a discussion around how to or should we proceed with that and uh, fortunately uh, 17 out of 27 countries voted for continuing with the green deal and saying that whatever will be the the recovering solutions they have to be green so I think it's it's so important to remember that it, uh, that despite of being in a let's say the the mode where where you um, you are fighting for your life you don't uh, you can't forget about the commitments that you have already taken. Um, just uh, two points to add: the second choice would be investing more in education from most my side uh, we had the privilege to to live in a country where uh, just the week after the uh, corona lockdown in in estonia our students had the privilege to start uh, learning online basically almost 100 percent so it it uh, it's sure that uh, our children has the access to education and that should be a norm for all the other countries too. And, uh, and uh, thirdly, I think uh, rethinking the global economy um, when uh, China uh, was um, hit by the crisis and, and uh, we couldn't uh, proceed with our trade, usual trading and importing from China. We saw that in a couple of weeks, we basically had serious troubles with, uh, with uh, getting uh, necessary supplies and the European economy and also in, the, in other developing con de developed countries, we, we had serious problems and that shows how dependent we are from each other. So that's that's also very important that uh, when we are rethinking our economy that we rethink also the dependencies there. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Marily, for for that. Uh, uh, bringing the, the, the uh, mentioning the Green Deal. I hope that we hold ourselves accountable because that, that would be uh, leading the rest of the world in the direction that we want to go. Uh, Vanessa, I know that you, you've been very, very active um, in, 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 with regards to uh, climate action and specifically in the Congo Basin. Um, what do you think the world should prioritize as we recover from this pandemic? Well, um, thank you so much for that question. And um, this would go in regards to the international community. 
I think that um, we need to prioritize the most important things and to also lead by example. Yes, I understand that um, the international community um, that I'm speaking about Europe has signed to lead the way in avoiding climate disasters, but we are clearly seeing that it is responsible for the new coal power plants that are being opened up in Europe. And then you find that the European, European Central Bank has invested over 7 billion in the fossil fuel industry in the last two months since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started. So clearly, I think that um, Europe is not leading by example when it comes to addressing the issue of climate change. I think that it is some form of greenwashing to make us think that it is actually leading the way to a Green New Deal, and yet it is continuously opening up new coal power plants and financing the fossil fuel industry. So I really want the, the entire world, especially the international community, to lead by example, to lead by action and not to lead by words and empty promises. Because at the end of the day, we the young people, we the activists, we are watching every move that they are taking. I mean, what kind of example are they showing to the rest of the world, especially the developing communities, the developing countries that are affected most by the climate crisis. If they see that Europe is not leading the way in addressing climate change in their actions, you don't expect the same thing in the developing countries. So Europe uh, needs to step up their game and actually fulfill the words and the promises that they give to the young people. You cannot avoid a climate disaster. You cannot lead climate action. You cannot bring about a Green New Deal when you're continuously investing in the fossil fuel industry and uh, opening up new coal plants. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for holding us accountable to our words. And that's uh, the voice of the, the young generation because we have to ensure that we leave a better planet for that next generation. I'm going to go on, turn this over to Aaron to get your opening on, on this uh, on this matter. And I know that you're coming to this with a, um, you know, a, a, a an aspect of our livelihood that we cannot leave out of the of the conversation. And and we will come back to discussing the the, the controversies of our action. Aaron, I want you to to give us your perspective. What do you think the international community should prioritize to recover better from the pandemic? Well, thank you very much, Ari, uh, for the invitation to join this panel today. And, and thanks to all the panelists for their thoughts. I mean, I think I would, I would echo so many of the sentiments. And it actually points to the fact that I think the list of, of, of actions that you've provided um, are all important and that we have to have a unified response and that uh, progress against one of these aspects will you know, very much impact progress against another. So it is a tapestry that we're working with. Um, yes, by way of background, just to say I joined Global Citizen uh, just a few months ago as this pandemic uh, was just reaching its, you know, its fervor. Um, and uh, so it's been fan uh, fascinating to be part of an organization that is really focused on connecting citizens who want to take action with leaders and influencers who are able to uh, move that forward. So, uh, but, I, but I also have a background in working uh, at the United Nations uh, as a representative of the United Kingdom mission. Uh, in intergovernmental negotiations. So a lot of my views are, are, are uh, informed by that uh, experience. Um, for these issues, I would say the top for me, uh, based on that background, is increasing solidarity between peoples. Um, you know, quite often uh, at the United Nations, when we would have a number of difficult conversations between governments, we would think, you know, if only aliens would invade, then we'd have a common enemy, right? Then we would all be able to unite and we just have to have somebody to fight against. And, and in, in the absence of that, we fight with each other. This, this pandemic, this COVID pandemic is our alien invasion in, in my mind. This is the, the unseen enemy that will affect all of us and requires a collaborative response in order to actually tackle it. Um, so if we think about it that way, then building solidarity making sure that any efforts to divide us are, are being stamped out and actually efforts to unite our, our common cause uh, have to be 
you know, it, it sounds trite, but I think more than ever, it's important that we have a unified response to this. And we're, and I think that leads into my second point, which is addressing the inequalities that have deepened because of COVID. And I think that's the important aspect of that have deepened, that existed before COVID, that so many of our uh, systems do not uh, benefit everyone equitably. Uh, and that has led to uh, a situation where this global pandemic is affecting us all uh, to varying degrees, all very much so, but certain communities are going to be even more impacted, have less tools to be able to respond and recover better. Um, you know, going with the analogy of the alien invasion, if we're trying to build our team of superheroes to fight that invasion, we're, we're, our team isn't ready, right? So many of our, our heroes, their powers haven't been tapped. Some don't have the tools, some are fighting amongst each other. So there needs to be a, a unification looking at building up the, the underlying strength of humanity, I think, at this moment, um, in order to be able to, to actually deliver a response that, that sticks. Um, and finally, I would say human rights, having a focus on human rights is so important if we're trying to recover better. And that goes back to this idea of what, is, what, are, what are we here for? What is humanity about? And my view, and I think Global Citizen's view, is that it's about building a world where the maximum number of people can go through their life course without facing discrimination and violence, able to be their best selves and contribute to the next generation so that the next generation is faster, stronger, healthier, more peaceful, more secure in the environment. And so this is a moment of great you know, trauma for the world, but it's also an opportunity for a, a, a new deal, a new deal that is based in climate action, I think, because that's really, if without a world, we don't have anything to work with. But, uh, but, but that, that have some of these principles embedded so that we can do a, a, a new version of, of ourselves that, that is a little bit more satisfying and equitable. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Aaron, uh, for, for, that, for that perspective. Uh, you, and really, you hit the, the nail on the head of what this whole dialogue is. Uh, we really need to build that solidarity. And, and your analogy about the alien forces is quite interesting um, because that's basically what this virus seems to be. We have a common enemy. Um, and let's just quickly go on to, to uh, I just want to get your views on this. Um, if we were to take a longer view, if we were to picture the world we want in 25 years, um, what three things would you want to see uh, in, in, that, in that future world? Um, let, let me begin with Merrily this time. Um, good question. <laughs> I think that was the one that I thought uh, the longest. Uh, I think, I, of course, the first one for me would be more environmental protection because it's it's the thing that uh, no matter what we do here, we can survive without the environment uh, unless we yeah, exactly, invite aliens or go to another planet, then there's like not much we have left if we ruin our environment. So that's quite obvious uh, uh, choice for me. Uh, secondly, also considering that uh, we as a foundation are working in, a, in uh, educating organizations to implement and, and uh, learn more about circular economy and zero waste principles, then of course, more more sustainable production and consumption is a is something that we hope in 25 years uh, will appear uh, but that's not something that we can achieve without actually um, doing as Vanessa said before not only talking the talk but walking the walk showing that uh, we have to take some serious action to reduce current current um, current uh, dependence on the fossil fuels for example and the third pick uh, from my side would uh, be related to my last um, answer is um, better access to education because that's the fundament, that's the ground where we can we can start building uh, new solutions. Um, that's 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 I think the basis where we have to start. Thank you very much, Mary. In a in the interest of time, I'm going to go on to, to question three, and I'm going to invite um, uh, Ricky here to talk about which, uh, what global trends uh, do you think will most affect our future? 
from your from your perspective and with the knowledge and experience that you have what 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 do you think are the trends that would affect most affect our future yeah uh, thank you so much and uh, yeah so i i mean i went through all the points and i believe that uh, you know when it comes to armed conflict and uh, politically motivated violence and terrorism and uh, you know and these are the things that will probably affect us uh, uh, the most uh, simply because uh, uh, it uh, uh, these things make it very difficult for people to speak with speak to each other it makes it very difficult for pe for people to actually open up a dialogue and and have conversation and when you don't have conversation when you cannot open up a dialogue uh, then basically good things just do not happen you know it's it's just bad things that happen when people are not speaking to each other and when people are suspicious of each other so yeah so i believe that uh, this is a global trend that uh, that, that could affect uh, us the most in the future because this uh, everything is interconnected and uh, and i believe that uh, uh, this particular trend could uh, could affect everything when it comes to the environment and everything to do with the sustainable uh, sustainable development goals um and vanessa what what are your thoughts on this and uh, um, vanessa whilst you are uh, that also um consider what you know what tell us what trends you think would affect our future most and you can also talk about how what what can we do to motivate people around the world um to ensure that we are having uh, more healthy societies um i guess um i personally think that the continuous destruction of uh biodiversity and ecosystems is going to pave way for more pandemics for for humanity. I worry about a trend of um, more pandemics like one that we are facing right now. Because if we the people continuously invade the habitats of the animals, um, I remember us talking to, to my father and he was trying to explain a certain kind of relationship the animals have with some of those pathogens and uh, he explain that they have a mutual kind of relationship in that the virus can live within the animal, but then they both benefit from each other. So basically, if we destroy the, the homes of these animals, or if we consume some of these animals, you realize that we are inviting these pathogens into our systems, because if they lose their habitats, if we kill the animals, if we destroy the homes of the animals, the virus will try to look for a new home. And the next home is the home of a is the body of a human being. So I worry about more trends of such pandemics that will um, affect humanity and claim very many people's lives. So we need to watch out how we protect biodiversity, ecosystems, forests, and all that. Because at the end of the day, we the humans, we are responsible for these pandemics that we actually face. And also, I worry about a trend of more catastrophic climate events, especially in the most affected communities. I mean communities, especially those in the global south, because at the end of the day, we cannot keep the the temperatures below 1.5 degrees if the leading communities are continuously investing in the fossil fuel industry. There is no way we'll be able to keep the temperatures below that degree. And this will create a way and a path for more catastrophic events that are already happening in these uh, most affected communities in the global south. So I worry about more trends of climate disasters if the leaders do not step up their game and work on what they are supposed to do instead of trying to uh, temporarily please the young people and uh, find a way of silencing them. Because when you promise that you're going to do something, uh, it's like me asking my mother for something and she tells me she will give it to me. I will definitely calm down and not pester her to give me that thing because I know she's going to do it. So I feel like it's hypocrisy on the side of the leaders when they tell us that they are going to take action, they are going to lead the Green New Deal and then they just disappoint us. So I worry about um, more pandemics in terms of uh, 
health, mm -hmm. uh, like what we are facing right now, the COVID-19. And then I worry about uh, more catastrophic climate disasters that are going to bring about uh, food insecurities and water insecurities in, uh, in the global south. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, Vanessa for, for really uh, making the point about what we need to pay attention to uh, to ensure that um, the future gets uh, better because those trends um, they're there they are not going to go away. Um, uh, let me just uh, because we're having this dialogue, I want to find out from the audience uh, with a, a short uh, pool here uh, how important or not is it for countries to work together to manage these trends, the ones that these trends that we have just spoken about, um, is it essential? Is it very important, fairly important, not very important or not important at all? Um, we would like to hear, get the, the general perspective of our audience about these trends that we have just spoken about. So if you uh, can take a moment and respond to um, the, the pool, it will be great. So we have about 75% agreeing that it's, it's, it's essential, it's important that the world works together. Um, 23% believe that it's very important. So almost, almost 100% um, of, of us believe that it's very important and essential. 2% uh, believe that it's fairly important. Uh, nobody thinks that it's not important. So this is, must be the priority um, in the way that uh, we move forward. Now, let me turn to the audience. You've heard from, let me turn to the panelists, sorry. You, you've heard from the, the audience. Um, let, let me go to Aaron. Uh, the audience has spoken. What do you say with reference to how, how important? I know that you, you highlighted building solidarity at the beginning, but what are your thoughts looking at the response from the audience? Thanks, yeah, well, I guess it's a it's a pretty easy question, right? I mean, it's a kind of it's, a, it's ice cream cold, you know. Yes, yes, of course it is. But I think this is a re this does expose uh, a new way we need to think about inter international cooperation. Uh, you know, the SDGs I think were built on a promise that if we work together over the next fifteen years, we can achieve better global goods, right? We can be healthier, we can be better fed, we can be more peaceful, we can have better lives. But that's, but that's a, a promise that might not be fulfilled and it can only be fulfilled if we work together. What we're facing now with COVID is a global public bad. It's what will happen if we don't work together is much worse than what, if, what will happen if we do try. So, so I think that the, the balance has shifted. It's not an opt-in process. It's we all have to work together to, to deal with this or we will all suffer in various ways and continually so and for a much longer period of time. So it is, a, it is an opportunity to think about what is the, the flip side of that global goods promise, and that is the necessity of addressing global bads in a united fashion. Yeah, um, uh, Marilee, what would be your thoughts on, on that? I must. We have to admit that. Yeah, Marilyn, now we have, oh, it's gone off again. Yeah, yes, Mary can you hear me now? Okay, yes. thanks. Uh, just to add to Aaron that uh, uh, we have for too long um, focused on the disagreements uh, in the global cooperation, always talk about that, what is it that we don't disagree um, but uh, we need to focus on more agreements and we need to find that global consensus, uh, for example, on climate crisis and environmental protection. Um, unless we don't have that, there's no, no standard, there's no uh, like the basis for going or moving forward. And SDGs is a good example, but I think we have to take uh, um, a serious step um, 
on identifying which is exactly every country's and every society's role in the SDGs mm -hmm. and and also to analyze the progress a lot because there's there's a lot we already do but there's more we can do okay. so yes I agree it's essential thank you very much um, um, Ricky uh, let me hear from you uh, on uh, another question here is um, has COVID changed your views on cooperation between countries? Um, I guess, uh, I mean, the, the virus has pretty much shown us that, uh, that you know, that uh, crises like this do not have borders and, uh, you know, and uh, everyone's affected. So everybody needs to work with each other. So obviously, uh, you know, I, uh, I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody on this panel favors uh, much more cooperation between countries. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's also, uh, I believe that in my personal opinion, that it's also the, this particular crisis has divided, uh, uh, divided countries that were already in conflict. So they've divided them further. And uh, countries which are already friends, they've made them more friendly, you know. So uh, that's the way. So the divide and the separation has become far more because of this virus. And it's, it's deepened the gaps uh, or whatever you call them. Uh, 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 in some particular cases. So I think cooperation becomes extremely important because the world needs to understand and world leaders need to understand that, you know, the key to our planet and our world becoming more sustainable is actually working with each other. And there is absolutely no two ways about it. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ricky, with that, uh, with that response. Um, let me go on to uh, uh, Vanessa with the question, uh, with another question here is, Overall, do you think people in 2045, you're the youngest one here, uh, will be better off, worse off, uh, the same as, as they are today? Um, what, what would, would it be better, the same or worse? I, I personally think that the people will be worse off because of the decisions that I see um, and what the leaders are doing. I'll give an example of lectured. Uh, lectured is a, it's a lake in Africa and um, many people depend on, on the fresh waters of this lake. But you find that in uh, 50 years, this lake has shrunk to 10th its size and it's continuously shrinking and yet um, the people, the people's number is not reducing. The people are still continuously demanding for the fresh waters from the lake. So I mean that if we do not uh, address the greatest threat facing humanity right now, we are going to see people's lives uh, becoming more uh, devastated because of the climate disasters. What I can say is that um, the COVID-19 pandemic has clearly showed that we should, no, it has showed what we should expect when it comes to the climate crisis. Because when it started, not every government paid attention. Most of the governments thought that they were safe. They thought that they wouldn't get it. And in just a matter of a very short time, it was everywhere. And then we hear lockdowns and all that stuff. So it's clearly showing that the climate crisis, right now it may be affecting specific communities, but a time is going to come when it's going to be affecting everyone, when everyone will be a victim. So many think that they are secure because they're not seeing those impacts right now, but a time is going to come when the entire world will be seeing and experiencing the impacts of the climate crisis if our leaders don't take the action that we need right now. That's why I think the world will be worse off because we'll see more insecurities because with climate injustice comes insecurities. We'll see more food scarcity, water scarcity, health complications and many other challenges. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we absolutely need to pay clear keen attention to this and there is a certain urgency um, of now. Um, just be, be, I want to make sure that we, um, uh, Aaron, uh, I, want, I want to get your perspective on this question, but as you answer that question, I want to make sure that I also take an odd, a, a question from the audience um, with reference to this. Now, Vanessa has just uh, painted a picture, which is if we don't take action, it's going to be worse. 
I want to get your perspective, but there is also a question uh, from uh, one of the participants who says, um, with everything that we know, how can we actually build back better and makes reference to um, knowing that we have things like the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, um, things that are supposed to benefit everyone and apparently are, are not doing so. So how do we build back better? Um, first, your perspective on what the future looks like and responding to this question of building better. Thanks. Well, and I certainly, uh, you know, share the sentiment of Vanessa of uh, worry about the future and everything that she said is, is absolutely right. I guess, you know, the, 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 to play devil's advocate, the, you know, the trend of human progress is, is, is arcs in, in, in the direction of, of higher outcomes, right? And you can imagine, you know, people that were loving, living 100 years ago or 50 years ago, on average, you know, less people are living in poverty. There's more equality generally. But what I, so I, so I, I have a, maybe a, a more hopeful view that, you know, in 20 years, and I believe particularly this upcoming generation, those that are people that slightly younger than me are particularly savvy and, and the way that they've grown up with technology in many parts of the world have give a, a new opportunity to change the game for them. But I think things are moving so quick and, and particularly because of the climate crisis, you know, it's hard to predict in 20 years because in five years we could see collapse. In 10 years, we could see different types of collapses that will build on each other. So yeah, I mean, I think on the current trajectory, 20 years from now, the environment is gonna be in a much worse position and humans are gonna be in a much worse position. And I think this is an important thing. And this is something that I've utilized in discussions at, at the United Nations in the past, which is when we talk about environmental protection, it really only speaks to those, I, I assume those like people like that are on the call today who recognize the inherent value of nature uh, in and of itself, but also what it gives to us as humanity. I think what the COVID has explained and Vanessa picked up on that is that it, our encroachment on the environment is going to impact human habitation and human life. I do not fear the planet going extinct. The planet will continue. It's whether we will be a part of the planet or not. And in what way will humanity be able to survive on this planet? Mother nature will get rid of us. And in 10 million years, try again with the dolphins or the cockroaches or something, right? So this is a imperative for humanity. We need to protect the environment for ourselves. And it sounds selfish, but I think it's really important that we include that in the discussion because it speaks to a different constituency of people who don't really care about trees, but do like breathing and do like living on a planet, right? So I think it's important that we think about that and how, how our engagement with the climate change movement and mitigation and adaptation is reframed in a way of our engagement with, with our own habitat and how we expand it and how that impacts human life. Um, I think, yeah. And, and I hope, and I, but I, so I'm hopeful, but things can move fast. So we have to be on top of it, you know, or else the, the future will overtake us and, and things will come out of our control that, that we, we don't have a, a chance to pull the brake. Yeah. Um, so I, I think what's really important in this conversation and what has been highlighted is, is that there is a role that individuals have to play and really coins the, 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 the subject of this conversation about um, healthy lives, healthy planet, healthy societies, because all of that um, is what will determine how, how the future is going to look like for us. Um, with that said, I want to put all of you, all, all four of you panelists in the seat of the Secretary General, which is the hot seat now. Um, if, if uh, what would be your advice? I'm saying if you were the Secretary General, what would be, and you, or say you had to advise the Secretary General, uh, what would be your advice uh, to address all of these trends that we have had as, as conversations? And I want to begin with um, Ricky. So if I were the secretary general, um, of course, like, you know, the, there are probably three things that I would think about. One is that I would pitch for more power for the United Nations. I think intergovernmental bodies need to be, um, and this pandemic has pretty much shown us that intergovernmental bodies need to be made far more powerful than they are right now. So pitch for more power in every direction and in every vertical uh, so that strong steps and decisive steps can be taken. Uh, the second thing would be, I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, that 
I believe that uh, you know the divide between countries which are at conflict or are suspicious of each other is is getting wider and wider because of the crisis. And I believe that I think uh, as a Secretary General, I would uh, I would try to open up multiple levels of diplomacy in terms of soft diplomacy because I think soft diplomacy in with regard to the arts and uh, sports is really powerful because even if countries are at um, are at uh, opposite spec uh, opposite ends of the political spectrum, at least you know artists can collaborate with each other. And uh, they can teach uh, each other's nation about their own cultures. And so, even if countries are at war or at, at conflict or are suspicious of each other or at cold war, uh, at least the people are not hating each other, uh, which becomes a huge, uh, which, which becomes a huge advantage, you know. And uh, this, uh, the third thing is that I would uh, work on empowering individuals because even though there are so many problems on our planet, uh, environmental and otherwise, uh, I believe that the biggest threat to our planet is the constant thought. That everybody has, that somebody else will make a difference. You know, we are always waiting for, you know, intergovernmental bodies. We're waiting for governments. We're waiting for NGOs, corporations to make a difference. When the truth is that everything is based on behavioral change. And you know, and uh, uh, I'm I'm from India, and my father of the nation said that be the change you want to see, which is a very cliched phrase, but it's cliched because it's absolutely true. And uh, so that is what. So we need to uh, we need to try to empower the individual through the arts and through various other ways. Uh, that every individual has the strength and has the uh, has the power to make a difference just by making a difference in their own lives. Thank you very much, Ricky, for those uh, three uh, very poignant points. Um, Vanessa, what what would be your advice? Uh, well, my advice to the UN Secretary General uh, would be to first of all help in building resilience in uh, the most affected communities because at the end of it all um, it's not just about the talk it's not about the maybe the pity of what is happening in these communities but actually coming out and helping them for example by driving uh, development finance in our grassroots projects in these communities to make sure that um, if communities are facing an issue of food scarcity, as you address the issue of climate change, you need to address the issue of food scarcity that is happening right now by introducing uh, more regenerative ways of doing agriculture for these communities, by ensuring water harvesting ways for these communities that face water scarcity. And there are very many, very many people who are running these projects in their communities. There are those who are trying to run these projects, but then at the end of it all, um, the procedures for actually getting the resources to build these uh, these projects so that they are reliable and scalable, you find that it's very complicated, especially from the people who are from the most affected communities. So I would advise the UN Secretary General to try as much as possible to divert and uh, drive development finance in these communities so that they can build resilience and address the current issues that they are facing as a result of climate change. And then the other thing would be to to hold the international community without uh, any kind of fear because at the end of the day, we as individuals, we may take up our individual actions to try and save the planet, but then we clearly understand that it is the, the fossil fuel industry that is responsible for the climate crisis. So we need to hold those who have powers, who, are, who own this industry, so I would advise the UN Secretary General to try and hold these leaders accountable for what is happening. And then also to try and make the, the, the climate movement and the driving of climate solutions more inclusive, having more women on these discussions, because at the end of the day, the women are the most affected by the climate crisis, again, in the, in the global south, and having more indigenous people on the climate conversation what I'm trying to say is that we need more people on these discussions, in these negotiations, um, those from the most affected communities, because they can speak for themselves more than someone else speaking up for them. 
Thank you very much. Uh, holding us accountable, a lot more inclusion, building resilience. Aaron, what are your thoughts? What would be your advice to the UN Secretary General? Thanks. Well, I think it's kind of a trick question uh, because the Secretary General is at the behest of the member states of the UN. So I think it's a, it goes to the heart of what the United Nations can do. And I think Ricky made a good point of strengthening you know, the United Nations. I'm sure the Secretary General would support that. Um, but it links to what others have said of, of if we want to have the United Nations be able to respond to these types of crises and to be strong in the future, we as citizens have to hold our own governments accountable for supporting the institution, for putting the funding in the right direction. Uh, and for cooperating. You know, the UN is like a good marriage. You, you don't just get married and then it's it's fine, right? No, you have to recommit to that marriage every single day. You have to tell each other you love each other. You have to do things for each other to show that that partnership still matters. Uh, the UN is not a given. It could go away tomorrow. And, you know, World War III isn't a fantasy, right? So we have to lean into the institution that we have and make it better. And I think the Secretary General is on the right track. The other thing I'll say to that, just as a sub point, of what Vanessa brought up is I think, you know, and, and no surprise as a director for gender equality, but uh, addressing gender equality and inequity, I think is the greatest challenge that, the, and, the, and the greatest game changer that we can make as a humanity. You know, if I can go back to my original analogy of the superhero team, you know, half of our population is, is being under equipped for no good reason. And if we're going to address these global crises, we kind of have to have everybody's talents at the forefront. So it's a really practical reason to end discrimination and violence, particularly against women, but against minorities, against different sexual orientations, against indigenous communities. It's about that uniting moment. The last thing I'll say is global citizen, this is, this is our bread and butter. This is what we do in terms of trying to mobilize individuals who want to make a difference to be able to make that connection. And so I'll give a short plug to say that our newest campaign that we just launched last week is called Global Goal Unite for Our Future. And it's leading towards a summit on the 27th of June, uh, let, uh, partnered with the European Commission that is doing exactly this, trying to give a platform to global leaders to say, you wanna address this COVID crisis, it's time to put your money where your mouth is and we'll give you a platform to do that and, and, and give an entertainment moment to be able to connect everyone around the world to see what's happening. So I think this type of interplay is going to dictate the future. We cannot wait for institutions to solve. We cannot wait for those leaders to solve. If they're not doing it, we need to change those leaders, but we have to be a part of that conversation as citizens more than ever. Thank you very much, Aaron. I think you also um, did respond to one of the questions which I have in the Q&A from Riyad uh, Subrati, um, which was really in that regard, what can citizens, how can citizens who are implementing sustainable development goals, what access do they have? Um, and Merrily, what would be your advice? We're running out, we're beginning to run out of time. Um, so if you can keep this to two minutes and then we'll go on to um, our closing remarks by the uh, director of the uh, uh, SDG Action Campaign. So Merrily, your advice to the Secretary General. Um, yes, I would... Um direct back to the time when the UN was actually established that it's a United Nations, it's not the United Governments, it's, it's, it's an organization that should unite nations. And that's the thing that uh, we have to um, support the United Nations to unite nations. And, and through that journey, um, the organization and United Nations has to take the guiding role and not to only guide the governments, but guide the nations to support them, to nurture them, to ask what are the problems, what are the, the progress that they're making, what are the plans. So it's, it's, it's uh, more of a not taking it as a um, playground for governments, but for people. I think it's, it's the most important uh, thing that uh, the Secretary General can do in the coming years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Open the doors. Let this be the organization of the people, as I primarily. Um, at this point, I'm going, we're going to uh, go on to uh, listen to our, our host, the host of, of, of this uh, series of dialogues, um, uh, with, but none other than the UN SDG Action Campaign. And it's, uh, we're lucky to have uh, the director with. Thank you very much. Uh, Marina, for, for taking time to be with us. Um, you've heard from our panelists 
um, very interesting conversation. Uh, we would like to hear your, your, your thoughts to, to, to close out the day. So uh, first of all, you know, thank you, Ari, for yet another very inspiring and very rich conversation that, that brought together so many, you know, useful and, and inspiring points. And, uh, and, and it's very difficult to, you know, to kind of close, but uh, I, I just was inspired by, by many things that uh, all of you said, and I, and I just want to put the emphasis on, on some of the most important points that, that were made. And uh, first of all, you know, thank you for joining as panelists and, and for your time. And, and um, it's a real pleasure to meet virtually Vanessa. She was supposed to join our global festival in Bonn um, in, in April that uh, uh, unfortunately could not take place. And it's good to see again Aaron and, and Mary Lee and also Ricky, uh, which has been a kind of a long-standing, you know, friend and an advocate for the sustainable development goals. So it's it's good to be among inspiring, you know, people who are who are really trying to make a difference. And uh, just I want to start, uh, you know, I I go in a kind of random order. Uh, the, I want to start from what Mary Lee said, uh, you know, addressing the. The, the feedback to the Secretary General. I mean, she rightly so emphasized that the UN is about uh, nation working together. I, I would make it maybe even a step further. Uh, if we look at the charter, it starts with we the people. So I think the, the advice, and I think that the Secretary General is also thinking along those lines is really how to bring the people closer to the institution at all levels, and of course, uh, starting with the UN, uh, which was, uh, you know, designed in a time where governments, of course, had uh, had a greater say. But I think there is a recognition now that young people, parliamentarian, local governments, and civil society and private sector, you know, they, have, you know, there are ma many more voices that can make a difference, can support, can provide solution and need to be heard to create this, uh, you know, platform where then, you know, we can move ahead. And uh, I think then going back to kind of the order, a little bit the chronology of the conversation, uh, Natalie in her opening remarks uh, talked about, which for me is very important, is about the trust. And it's about the trust uh, between the people and the institution. And I think that we, definitely as a campaign, but I think all institutions, uh, you know, in, in a moment like, like now, we, we really need to, to find ways to build the trust between people and, and with the institution. And I think that the pandemic showed, and there are many uh, evidence and, and many research being done that somehow trust has increased during the pandemic. And, and we need to leverage the fact that, that citizen recognize or trusted more their governments, particularly at the local level. And we need to use this, this positive uh, element to really build and reconnect. And uh, these lead me to a second point. I think um, Natalie mentioned, Vanessa, you mentioned, and you know, even uh, more strongly about, uh, and also Ricky, you know, the individual action. I think uh, we, we can no longer, you know, wait and, and see, you know, what the governments are doing, what the, if the business leaders are changing their production partner, we need to start by taking action. And uh, somehow the lead, by example, that many of you mentioned, should start from anyone. Of course, uh, we expect, uh, my, myself as European, I expect and I will hold my European government accountable, but nothing prevent other governments and other leaders in other regions to also lead by example and, and create. And I think that the, the power of individual action, which was brought to the surface by the pandemic, which uh, can only be, uh, you know, um, challenged now by individual action is, is, the, is the importance, is the power of the individual. And uh, you see a butterfly on my, 
on my background and because we we all can start a butterfly effect that can really lead to a greater impact. So I think that what, what, what you said, uh, you know, many of you, I think has a very great uh, in, importance. And, and again, Ricky elaborated on behavioral change. And I, and I really believe, and, and I think we all believe, particularly uh, during this pandemic, that behavioral change has a very tangible and powerful impact. And, and we could apply it to other uh, of the goals to sustainability, to consumption, including, you know, the uh, with, uh, uh, you know, boycotting, you know, areas or, of, of the economy that are still heavily dependent on fossil fuels, as, as Vanessa was reminding us. And uh, then there is, a, you know, a very, a very important point, Aaron, you brought into the discussion, the issue of solidarity. With many of you a couple of weeks ago, actually during the, the first uh, UN 75 dialogue, we, we celebrated together the, 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 the act of kindness and, and hope and solidarity that people are showing, have shown during COVID and, and are continuously showing. But solidarity is, is not just, uh, you know, be nice. Solidarity also means that we all, uh, we are all entitled, we all uh, need to demand equal rights and opportunity. So we, solidarity should not be seen as a charity from one to other, but it's really allowing people to be empowered and to have access to the thing they are entitled to. So I think uh, we, as a campaign, and I think there is a growing movement saying we celebrate solidarity and, and we really want to uh, build a, a new world with a just recovery, which is based on equality, you know, among, you know, the different sector of uh, society. And uh, I also, and I know, you know, Eric tell me when to stop, uh, uh, when I, when I got of, but I'm very inspired, you know, by the conversation, Aaron talked about the global bags and, and how the alien you know, is making us, uh, um, you know, work uh, together. You know, you, you need an enemy to, to unite, sadly, but this is, you know, just my view. I would have thought that there was more coordination. There was more uh, feeling united. I think Yuriki mentioned, you know, the virus has no borders, that's clear. But at the same time, we see now borders that didn't exist for decades. So somehow the, the virus are no borders, but now there are back borders. And, and, I, and I think this is something that, that, that we need to really reflect upon. And, uh, and in a way we have an alien enemy, but some leaders uh, decided not to cooperate to fight the aliens. And maybe they are creating other aliens enemies to actually use the virus to further divide us. So I think we, I, I believe, and I'm an optimist like Aaron, you know, there is an opportunity to change things. There is an opportunity to change priority, to change in investment. And, and of course we need millions of Vanessa to of course uh, continue to march and, and strike on Friday. But at the same time, there are also Many people, sadly, that want to go back the way things were, and, and we will need to be extremely strategic and extremely loud in the coming months because it's not a given. So um, I let me end uh, um, using, you know, what uh, um, Ricky mentioned, you know, be the change you want to be. I think we can all start that change, but at the same time, there is a space now to demand our leaders to then, you know, lead by example and, and do their part as well. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marina, for summing this, uh, this up um, with everybody. Um, we're going to, um, in, in, by way of closing down, um, I want to make sure that we, uh, I thank the people who followed us on YouTube as well. And, um, we have this great comment from uh, one of the 
uh, people who's following us on YouTube, uh, uh, Dominique Whelan, who is really talking about the Irish experience with collaboration. That the, uh, whilst we may sometimes think that the world has so many challenges, the, the belief that the SDGs really created an opportunity for the Irish to start thinking about broader collaboration in, in that sense. So there is an opportunity there that we can emphasize. Uh, one thing that we want to end up with is, is a pool, is basically to continue this conversation with our audience. So we're going to throw up a poll um, and, uh, and then I may be responding to some of the questions that um, have been asked. But here's the question that we have. What actions do you implement in your daily life uh, for climate action. So this is two individuals. One of the things that most of the participants has emphasized here is how citizens can play a role. So I want to find out from the audience what they are doing to, to advance uh, climate action in their, in their daily lives. And this would be a good way um, to have uh, our, our panelists uh, close this. So, um, uh, please uh, take the, the the call. I've also um, we we I know we had a we also had a conversation uh, a question from uh, Alexandra um, Sloboda. Things are beginning to open up in London, and in the last two weeks there has been a significant rise in uh, in pollution um, just within the last two weeks. So, what is it that she asked, what is it that we can do to motivate cities around the world to ensure that as we begin to open up, we don't see a spike in, in pollution? And I think that the response is probably going to lie in what we citizens do, what action we're, we're, we're taking um, to be able to respond to that. We also did have a question with reference to um, what citizens can do, uh, those who are implementing the SDG action SDGs in their daily lives. Again, I think this uh, pool is going to give us an idea of some of the things that um, uh, people are doing. And maybe by sharing the results, we can be able to inspire people to know what to do. So, and here we go, here are the results of the pool. So 78% of our audience use uh, reusable products, including bags and bottles, which is really good. This is really a good audience. 51% do car share, use public transportation and bike and fly less. Well, everybody's flying less with this, with the, with the pandemic. Um, they also, 68% implement practices to consume and waste less. Um, that's a good one for Merrily. Um, then 64% uh, um, use energy wisely. So um, um, I know Vanessa has really called our attention to, 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 to how we interact with, with the environment. Use renewable energy, 44%, and 40% uh, consume climate-friendly diet. That's very interesting. While 63% support climate activism movement. So Vanessa, you are in good company. Um, and 51% vote and advocate for uh, climate friendly policies. So we have an audience here that's very conscious about what that future is. Um, and that knows that the destiny of the planet lies squarely in our hands. We are above time now. We would have loved to continue this conversation, but I'm very sorry we have to stop here. And I want to thank you, the audience, those of you um, that are in the webinar and those of you that are listening online for taking time to be with us. Particular thanks goes to our panelists. Your perspective has been great. This conversation was very rich. As part of the UN 75 dialogue series hosted by the SDG Action Campaign, we will be having another conversation on Wednesday, January 7, uh, June 17, and that's going to be focusing on economic transformation. How can we build better in the future? Thank you very much. Stay safe, everybody.